Welcome to Fossil Creek Tree Farm and Nursery. I'm Max. I'll be your garden coach today. Today we're going to be talking about herbs, using them in the landscape, and a few other uses too. So we'll get right into it. Uh, I don't know how a, the definition of an herb really is, but if we feel like calling it an herb, it is. Um, and if you disagree, that's fine too. But uh, we'll start off with uh, being really glad that it's October and the weather is on our side instead of constantly uh, stressing us and the plants. So uh, here in North Texas, fall is like our second spring. The nice thing is with each day, the weather is more likely to be milder rather than getting hotter every day. So... Uh, the plants appreciate that, so do we, uh, and we'll start off with uh, one that really does appreciate it, aloe, which, what can I say, everybody knows about it, but it's uh, not winter hardy right now, uh, and going into the fall, it can take full sun, part sun's enough, but uh, through the summer, uh, full sun is a little too fierce for them. Part sun is best. In fact, if you, uh, July, August, September, if you have it in full sun, it's probably going to get to be kind of a light brown color. And that's saying, help me. Uh, give me a little more shelter. And I didn't realize it so much until a few years ago we had some out here in full sun that were getting discolored like that. And I realized they don't need all this sun. I moved them into a, a part sun area and within three days, I think maybe two days, three at the most, I was surprised it went from, you know, kind of brown to a great looking green in a couple days. All, and I didn't realize it would recover that fast and that it hadn't really been hurt. That was just, I guess, a survival technique for uh, the incineration that uh, takes place in July, August. But uh, we've reached the point now where a lot of plants that are uh, even uh, part sun to shade can tolerate full sun because it's not as intense. The sun's going down, you know, so it's going through more atmosphere. And everybody's noticed the days are considerably shorter. So that's a uh, you know, when the, when the sun is up at 6 or something and it goes down at 9, that's a long, hot day, especially when the low was like 83. Now we're into hopefully the high won't even be 83. So uh, that makes it a whole lot easier on the plants and us. Uh, perennials uh, to use in uh, landscapes, a lot of the perennials are perennials. A lot of the herbs are perennials. So they can be used in landscapes. Uh, primarily they would fall into two categories in that situation. Uh, ground covers and compact shrubs. Uh, one of the uh, big ground covers, although I say this with a caveat, uh, mints really like to cover the ground. As I say, they, they know go, but they don't know woe. So uh, you, you can put them out in a flower bed. And also, sometimes people say, I have a place that's wet and everything I plant there dies. Well, mint's probably the thing that can tolerate it because it likes moisture and will put up with kind of a soggy soil, which most herbs won't. Uh, most herbs, that'll kill them. Mint likes it and it uh, goes and goes and goes and uh, it's a perennial so it's going to be there uh, if you wanted to contain it if you had a uh, like an eight inch deep barrier uh, that would probably keep it in check but um, if not you're going to have to keep it in check uh, some of the neat ones that we have uh, double mint and chocolate mint 
peppermint, and spearmint, and uh, devil mint. And uh, the neat thing about uh, about herbs is, you know, there's the uh, cliche that I think if I hear it one more time, I, I I I may faint. I'm not sure, but we've we hear it and we hear it, and it's like, but you know, that's one of those things. Why do you hear cliches? Because they're true, and of course, the cliche is is that we're a society now of instant gratification. Okay, well, then we're set because one of the things that herbs like mint provide is fragrance. And you don't have to wait until they get big or until they set fruit or months or years. It, they're that way right now. You know, they're pungent uh, immediately so uh, no waiting around and you can use them as a ground cover or uh, if you want to protect yourself you know put them in a big pot and then or something that uh, I've meant to do I guess in later life well now I'm there so I guess I should do it uh, they do trail so they would make kind of a neat thing in a hanging basket and there are people too, me being one of them, that like to water. Well, with mints, you know, a lot of herbs, if you like to water and you water them, you will be in the market for more herbs because those will die. So, but if you like to water, mints just the thing. And of course, if you were to put them in a hanger basket, uh, they're convenient for a little snort when you walk by. And uh, they uh, easy to water, and you can place them anywhere you want. And let's see. And okay, who else? Well, since we're on a fragrance uh, trend, we'll jump in with a with an annual, or I, I guess I could say a tender perennial uh, lemon verbena. Makes a little woody shrub, it has a great lemon scent. It won't take a, it probably be okay with light freezes, but a hard freeze, it's not going to be up to it. So that one would be a, a, a good thing in a pot. And of course, since we're talking about um, one of my favorite aromatherapy things, and since we're talking about using herbs in landscapes, um, pots can be used in landscapes. You know, if you've got, you know, shrub and around, you know, stuff around the patio, your your containers don't have to remain on the patio in that kind of environment. You can set a pot out in a shrub border. Uh, one of the things that that does is it gives you some hardscape there that gives you a little relief. It's not just all foliage, flowers, foliage, flowers. You have a little break for your eye. If you have a big pot there, it kind of interrupts it and it puts some hardscape in there. It's a, a more relaxing appearance. Kind of gives your uh, eyes a break in the landscape. And that also uh, enables you, if it were something like a lemon verbena, uh, it can be out in the landscape when we have mild weather and then when things turn really colder. Uh, everybody around their house, you've got microclimates so you put it to a warmer area. And then if it's a really cold thing, you know, something you can pull in temporarily. The neat thing about our cold weather when it shows up is it's usually two days and then it's warming back up. So, uh, okay. And let's see. So, well, we'll talk about another annual. It's a cool season thing. Uh, cilantro uh, and it likes the cool weather fall winter spring and it's a very popular uh, herb and now's the time get them out there and 
they will tolerate quite a bit of cold. That's not one I would worry about. And let's see, what else? Of course, I'll briefly just touch on a few things. You know, the herbs provide color, texture, movement, taste. We've already talked about fragrance. Um, and, of course, movement. You know, grasses provide that. doesn't take much of a breeze to get some motion going. And here's something new. This is lemongrass. And here's a new one on me. This is from a, a uh, top-notch grower that's... I was buying from them when I was in a nursery when I was 20 years old, so that's been a while back. And they were there before me, so, uh, but uh, I usually think of lemongrass as a tender perennial, but now they're saying on this one that it's zone 7. Who knew? Well, zone 7, in case you're wondering, we're zone 8. The smaller the number, the colder. In zone 7, that means your average winter temperature is 0 to 10. So, I'm going to have to plant one to see if it lives up to its, its billing. But um, uh, a very popular grass. Uh, culinary uses. And some tout it as repelling mosquitoes and whatever. I don't give any testimonials on mosquitoes. And then, of course, the most popular, probably, of the annual herbs, basil. You know, this is the Genovese uh, sweet. And, of course, culinary use, many culinary uses. And these guys are full sun to part sun. And probably a pot on these because uh, they're an annual they would prefer that it didn't get below 40. So, uh, <coughs> but uh, if you protect them, they can go a long time. They grow fast. Uh, depending on how big your family is, just one or two plants put out quite a bit. And they like being used, trimmed. So you're not going to, I think the more you use them and trim them, the more they like it. And these guys over here, <clears throat> they're not herbs. Okay, sue me. But we had such neat colors with the sun shining on them. I just had to bring them over. This is a Swiss chard. And uh, this, this variety is bright lights. You can see all the yellows and pinks and reds. And... They're winter hardy, and they can get, you know, a foot and a half or two feet tall. And they make a neat little companion for uh, the basil. And, okay, now we're going into the uh, perennials. And, like I said, most of those, if you're going to use them in your landscapes, they're going to stand out as uh, ground covers. Some of them quite low, and others in a medium size. But you could start out with, also they can uh, perform as evergreen shrubs. And that would be uh, rosemary. This is the big guy, kind of uh, the uh, Tuscan blue, which is known as the, uh, the rosemaries. That's the workhorse. It can get five, six feet, maybe even more. A big guy. And, of course, they're uh, very amenable to shearing and shaping. So if you want one... In a Christmas tree shape, this would be the good guy to use for it. It'll fill your spare time, you know, that trimming. And, uh, of course, we've got quite a group here going into the ground cover. This one, uh, Huntington Carpet. And, of course, you probably can't see this, but if you come down, you can see it. It shows that, you know, if you have a, a wall, you know, elevated a really neat thing for trailing over and uh, late winter early spring of course these will all bloom little blue flowers which is neat 
and it seems like I get flowers at other times of the year here too, so don't count them for just that. And uh, Chef's Choice, this is uh, a relatively new one, uh, neat looking with the, kind of the white stems. It'll get a foot and a half, two feet tall. Uh, very good for culinary use. Of course, so is, so is the Tuscan Blue. And I think we have a different size of Huntington carpet. And uh, trailing rosemary, similar type to Huntington carpet. And hardy rosemary, which basically here they're pretty all hardy. And I think that does it for those. And uh, just to clarify, a lot of times people think of rosemaries as they're a Mediterranean plant and they don't need much water at all. Well, uh, when it's hot, they don't want to get dry and stay dry. It won't necessarily kill them, but uh, their appearance will suffer. So uh, if they're in a pot, you're going to have to water a little more often. If they're in the ground and they get an established root system, wouldn't have to be as often, but you don't want to... Uh, they're most uh, tender about it when it's really hot. You don't want to let them get dry and stay dry because uh, that'll stress them to the point that um, the foliage is going to be hurt. And of course, one of the uh, notes, this is our reading plants class on a rosemary. It should be dark green. If it starts to get a lighter green, that probably means it's needing a drink. And then if the, the new growth tips start to weep over. He's saying, please, I need water. Give them a good drink. They'll be up in just 15 minutes. Um, but don't think of them as a yucca or something like that, that you know you can just ignore the water. Uh, and let's see. Well, I thought I brought more over. Oh, here we go. Okay, the next item similar to rosemary's, and you can use it in a similar fashion as a kind of a, a compact shrub or a mini shrub, are uh, lavenders. And they're not quite as tough or resilient as uh, rosemary's as far as water is concerned. Uh, they typically don't need as much. They're more sensitive to... If they're staying too wet, they're unhappy. The two things that lavender doesn't like, shade and uh, soggy roots. So if they're, if they're in the ground, you're probably around here, you're, you're going to have to amend the soil and, with planter's mix and that kind of thing. And when you do that, uh, basically you're going to be creating a raised bed. Even if you don't have a, a border around it, wood or rock or whatever, you want to add enough organic material that you're uh, dramatically increasing the drainage. Because if you don't do much of a soil prep around here and you do lavender, uh, probably not going to have a good outcome. Because at some point it's going to get, even if it's just nature, and you know, if it rains an inch or two uh, and it stays wet for too long, it doesn't take it long to get unhappy. And of course, when we're on that subject, the other thing, too, is uh, I mentioned about the rosemary, about it being sensitive, being too dry when it's uh, really hot. Well, now we're kind of getting into the other area, and that is when it's cooler, uh, two things that reduce a plant's need for water, less light and lower temperature. You know, they're not going to use it up as fast. So uh, it's easier to keep things too wet once we cool off. So that's, you would have to be sensitive about that on lavenders. Um, if, it's, if it's in a pot here and I'm in doubt, I pick it up because the mix that it's in is very light. If there's any weight, that's from water. If it feels heavy, it's probably not going to need a drink. If I go to pick it up and I nearly throw it over my shoulder, uh, that means it's pretty dry and it's ready for a drink. But um, be cautious about that. In fact, when 
you have to keep an eye out when things are really hot that they get a drink when they need it because uh, damage to the plant will occur more quickly than if it's a mild temperature. So you don't have to be as concerned about uh, letting it get kind of dry when the temperatures are cooler because it's if it gets a little too dry, it's not like it's going to get damaged. You know, if it's 105, that's different from if it's 65. So uh, keep that in mind. And most of the most of the lavenders that we have are uh, oh here it is. I thought you know when in doubt check all your check all your preparations. I thought I was losing my mind there for a minute. I wasn't sure, but. I knew I had gathered some more lavenders, and here they are doing their thing. Most of the ones we have, if um, uh, French lavender is typically not as hardy as English lavenders, and a lot of times when you see something called sweet lavender, that's typically a French lavender. It's not as cold hardy, but these guys, we've got uh, Goodwin Creek, a neat kind of grayish uh, look. And Provence, that's a, as we might say, an oldie but a goodie. Very, very tough and a neat look. And a new, uh, I guess we've had this one before, but uh, Super Blue. And to give you an indication, he's showing off now, but uh, he's showing a uh, hardiness zone. Five to eight. I don't even want to think about zone five, but that's really cold. So, uh, like I say, the only way you're gonna that he's in danger then is if you plant him in shade, it's not gonna work. And if he stays soggy, he's done. Let's see. Okay, and did I? And here's the sweet lavender. Okay. Okay. And now the ground cover types. If you want a itty bitty ground covers, creeping mother of time, these guys are they're in the cute club, you know. And they stay low. And they're tough. They look kind of wimpy and frail and fragile, but they're a tough plant, full sun to part sun. They want some moisture, but they want to have pretty good drainage. They don't. Now we're now we're into the into the herbs that they don't want to be in a swamp. But give pretty good coverage. Stay low. They're not going to crowd anybody out. Uh, you can over time, you know, clip them a little bit, but not much is going to be necessary. They get kind of woody, but uh, a tough plant. And the next scale up from them are oregano's. Uh, this one's hot and spicy. It lives up to its name. It's pretty neat. Italian oregano. And Greek oregano, and this one is similar to it, but uh, 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 sweet majorum. Uh, it's a perennial, but here it's going to be kind of a tender perennial. So, uh, but uh, a neat, a neat fragrance and culinary use. And then now we're going to throw in a new term. Biennial, which, if you read in some books on uh, parsleys, it'll be listed as a perennial. Well, short term, you know, a, a biennial, it grows foliage the first year. The second year, uh, it'll produce blooms to procreate itself, and then it's done. But so you could say short-term perennial. But the neat thing for us here is they go through the winter. They're going to be evergreen. 
Um, and uh, of course, add a little pungence to uh, scramble eggs or salads or whatever. Uh, Italian parsley is probably the the uh, the best culinary one, and then the curly parsley. Uh, I like it for uh, ornamental use in in pots, but you can do it in the ground. But everything's better in a raised bed around here. And let's see. And a couple more rosemary, we have in smaller sizes. Also, uh, hardy rosemary, which we had here. And uh, ARP, ARP, that was one that was discovered somewhere in Texas, and I think years and years ago, and it was probably in the proximity to a really hard winter, and it sailed through it in great shape. So it's a... Uh, that's kind of what got it into being propagated is it's particularly tough. And then uh, Burgarten sage, and it's a bigger leaf. And of course, this one's the one that we're coming up on the season. You know, it's going to go in the turkey. This is the stuff. But I love this one because... It's got a bigger leaf, and as it gets more established, the leaves will get bigger. It's kind of a, a grayish uh, uh, cast to it, and kind of a marbly, little marbly texture on the leaf. I'm going to put him over here for later mention. And let's see. Oh, here we go. Now we're getting into herbs that some of them maybe you want to call it an herb and maybe not, but I'll do the last mentions here on you know, texture, uh, an annual fern leaf dill, uh, super duper texture. You know, gets pretty good size, doesn't take the cold weather, but it grows fast and looks gorgeous. And of course, culinary uses. And then uh, the German chamomile. Everybody's heard of chamomile tea. I've never had any, but here it is. And it likes cool weather. Uh, I'm not, I'm, it's a, probably, well, well, the winter is iffy, but it does like cool weather, so uh, I would suspect that if it got cold enough to burn the foliage down, uh, if it was established, it would come back when the real cold is gone. That's typically the way, the way things work. And we don't want to leave the cats out. We've got catnip, and, you know, that one is, you know, it's a perennial. Not all cats love it, but who knows. And I'm going to distinguish between catnip and cat mint. They're different. Catnip, you know, that's for the kitties. And cat mint, it's a perennial, blooms blue, loves heat and sun. He's not in bloom right now, but blooms for a long time during the, the heat part. It's relatively short. You know, it's got a foot and a half. You know, if it went crazy, it might get a little taller. But loves the sun and blooms blue. Tough, tough guy. And here's one that people either love or hate. I don't like to eat licorice, but I do really like the smell. And uh, see, we've got frowns in the audience. So I'm not trying to persuade anybody, but I do like the smell of it. That's Mexican mint marigold. It blooms uh, little uh, yellow flowers in the fall. It's a perennial. And, you know, he'll, he'll get up about like 
two feet or so. Kind of a neat looking foliage. I just throw this guy out there. It's not an herb. Sue me. It's a little olive tree. But you know what? It's got an herb vibe, doesn't it? You know, if you've got rosemary and lavender, boy, an olive tree just fits right in. We've got little guys, we've got medium, we've got medium big, and we have huge. We just got in, I think we have 200 gallon olive trees. So, uh, a neat look. And this is one of those, you may not think of it as an herb, but it's in an herb, it's in every, I think every herb book I've got, you know, uh, lamb's ear shows up. And it's another one that, you know, uh, a lot of varieties, if you crush a leaf, it smells like pineapple. That's enough for me. But uh, it's also, if you have kids, this is the most petted herb in the garden since it's so soft and fuzzy that uh, everybody's got to pet that one. And it is perennial. It's tough. The main thing that, and it'll do full sun to part sun. And, of course, it's... Uh, a little bit in the category of uh, lavender. It doesn't want to be soggy. If you keep it soggy, uh, you're on your way to having an available space there because he's, he's not going not gonna to tolerate that. If it gets really cold, it could burn some of the foliage, but it'll pop right back. So he's dependable. And, uh, uh, of course, there's one that's really neat use uh, in the landscape since for all practical purposes it's uh, evergreen and it kind of looks neat with looks neat with an olive tree too and let's see and this one uh, yarrow uh, now some of these things that have an herb designation uh, how long do you think herbs have been around? A very long time. So they were around before there were pharmacies. So in ancient times, the herb garden was the pharmacy. And some of them, things like yarrow, you know, they have a list of uses that obviously we're not doing them anymore. But and I'm not going to go through them. But uh, that one was that was in the herb garden for medicinal purposes. Now it just has neat foliage, neat blooms, very heat tolerant. Um, now the, the main knock against this one is, uh, I think, and, and people have a point, well that looks kind of weedy. Well, if you have a um, perennial kind of area that looks a little kind of not manicured, you know, not formal, looks a little wild, you know, this guy's going to fit in. He does look kind of wild. Comes in some neat colors, too. Speaking of what shows up in herb books, and you can use it in the landscape, and I don't know if we've had these before, but obviously we have them now. And... You know, you can't keep a good man down, and I guess you can't keep a good herb down. You know, he's he's so anxious to live, he, he's coming out of the drainage holes. So I would say there's some there's some vigor there, and this is a uh, elderberry. Of course, they produce berries that are good for jams and jellies and wine. And we have three gallons, and then. <laughs> Well, no, I think that's just a weed. But anyway, we've got one gallons too, and they're about as anxious to get going as three gallons. I think I'll have to have one of those just to watch it and see what happens. And then, of course, uh, Society Garlic. You know, it's a perennial. I brought it because, well, it's Society Garlic, you know. Has neat blooms, a neat look, a tough plant, evergreen. And we don't have any right now, but uh, he, he's standing in for chives. 
Uh, we'll be getting some, you know, uh, onion and uh, garlic chives, and they they will get, you know, about like that, that big around. Probably take them about a year to get up to be robust, but uh, chives uh, bloom. The uh, onion chives will bloom uh, pink, and garlic ch garlic chives will bloom white. And the blooms are edible, and they're tough plants. Okay, along with uh, using herbs in the landscape, everybody likes to have companions. So herbs get to have companions too. Alyssum, you know, trailing, kind of a ground cover type, has a neat aroma uh, or fragrance. You can do it in a hanging basket. Uh, these guys do fall and spring and I've had some here that sail through the winter like nothing, so that's kind of up in the air, but uh, uh, a neat performer. And of course, if you want to have uh, beneficial bugs in your garden, one of the things is that you want to do, and of course, pretty much all the herbs bloom, so if you have something, things blooming in your garden, all the time, you're going to keep pollinators and good bugs in residence. In fact, here lately I've seen uh, lace wings flying around, and they're a good bug, not lace bugs, that's a pest, but lace wings, and little light green about this long, and their, their wings are just real fragile, and uh, they have a neat... Uh, flying technique uh, it's not a 747 it's only a truck but uh, the lace wings I saw recently it I, it kind of hit me uh, the expression of the way they fly which is kind of delicate it looks like an ongoing accident is kind of the way they fly. It's kind of like, oh, I think I can, I think I can, I hope I get to something quick. And then they land on something and you just think, he, he, that little lace wing is going, whoo. But they're, uh, they're neat and uh, they're a predatory bug. They're nice to have around. And the uh, surprising thing, which is kind of, to me is kind of one of the definitive things about our winters we'll have like two really cold days and nights. And then I go out in my backyard and then we'll have a day that shows up like this. And I'll go out in my backyard and here goes a lace wing flying by. And it's like, where was he when it was 10 degrees? Well, he was somewhere because the day after he's out, you know, on the hunt. So, uh, That was my dexterity pa uh, test. I failed it. Uh, and here's another guy that makes it into the show, Dusty Miller. Is it an herb? Uh, well, I'm going I'm to say it is because uh, I just wanted to show him off. And evergreen gets like 12 to 15 inches tall and wide. And uh, a, if you want to have a... If you want to have a, a moon garden, you know, a bunch of things that stay kind of whitish during the night and, and lit up by uh, moonlight, he's a great candidate. And uh, silver brings out other colors. And, of course, I brought up these, uh, you know, blues, yellows, purples. So he would be a neat thing 
in the landscape and around herbs. And here are these guys that I told you I'd be bringing back. I'll bring him back too. You know, the sage with the kind of gray green, parsley with the crinkly green, which is, you know, a neat companion. And this is kind of a small, crinkly version of potato vine. Kind of a similar color. Not going to cover the world like potato vine, but sails right through the winter. It'll take the cold, and so it's a neat, neat thing for pots or raised beds. Uh, sets other things off. You know, green makes white look more white, and the white makes the green look more green. And I didn't, I didn't identify these guys. They're not herbs either. These are violas. They're like a miniature pansy. Tough as all get out and bloom and bloom and bloom. Sail through the cold weather, and also bringing back our other uh, cuties, you know, that times with the tiny leaves. You can put them in the flower bed or in pots. You know, they're both tough. They'll go through fall, winter, and spring. And so you can, you know, mix it up. And if there are any rules, you can break them. Uh, and I think that will about do it for our... Here, Josh. Our, There's an inspector in the driveway here. Forgot to turn my radio off. That will about do it for our herb fun. Uh, on Saturday, Josh is going to uh, have a class on Texas landscaping. And that's going to be at 9 a.m. And then uh, next week, Thursday... I'll have a class on planting a tree, and then on Saturday, we'll have a class at 9 a.m. 9 a.m. on Saturday about uh, picking out the right tree. So, thanks for tuning in.